Part 1. Your Parenting Legacy The cliché is true. Children do not do what we say, they do what we do. Before we even consider the behaviour of our children, it's useful, essential even, to look at their first role models, and one of them is you. This section is all about you because you will be a major influence on your child. In it, I'll give examples of how the past can affect the present when it comes to your relationship with your child. I will talk about how a child can often trigger old feelings in us that we then mistakenly act on in our dealings with them. I'll also be looking at the importance of examining our own inner critic so we do not pass too much of its damaging effects onto the next generation. The past comes back to bite us and our children. A child needs warmth and acceptance, physical touch, your physical presence, love plus boundaries, understanding, play with people of all ages, soothing experiences, and a lot of your attention and your time. Oh, so that's simple then. The book can end here, except it can't, because things get in the way. Your life can get in the way. Circumstances, childcare, money, school, work, lack of time, busyness. And this is not an exhaustive list, as you know. But what can get in the way more than any of this, however, is what was given to us when we ourselves were babies and children. If we don't look at how we were brought up and the legacy of that, it can come back to bite us. You might have found yourself saying something along the lines of, I opened my mouth and my mother's words came out. Of course, if theirs were words that made you feel wanted, loved and safe as a child, that would be fine but so often they are words that did the opposite. What can get in the way are things like our own lack of confidence, our pessimism, our defences, which block our feelings, and our fear of being overwhelmed by feelings. Or, when it comes specifically to relating to our children, it could be what irritates us about them, our expectations for them or our fears for them, we are but a link in a chain, stretching back through millennia and forward until who knows when. The good news is you can learn to reshape your link and this will improve the life of your children and their children and you can start now. You don't have to do everything that was done to you. You can ditch the things that were unhelpful. If you are a parent or you're going to be one, you can unpack and become familiar with your childhood Examine what happened to you, how you felt about it then, how you feel about it now. And, after having done that unpacking and taken a good look at it, put back only what you need. If, when you were growing up, you were, for the most part, respected as a unique and valuable individual, shown unconditional love, given enough positive attention and had a rewarding relationship with your family members, you will have received a blueprint to create positive, functional relationships. In turn, this would have shown you that you could positively contribute to your family and to your community. If all this is true of you, then the exercise of examining your childhood is unlikely to be too painful. If you did not have a childhood like this, and that's the case for a large proportion of us, looking back on it may bring up emotional discomfort. I think it is necessary to become more self-aware around that discomfort so that we can become more mindful of ways to stop us passing it on. So much of what we have inherited sits just outside of our awareness. That makes it hard sometimes to know whether we are reacting in the here and now to our child's behaviour or whether our responses are more rooted in our past. I think this story will help to illustrate what I mean. It was told to me by Tay, a loving mum and senior psychotherapist who trains other psychotherapists. 
I'm mentioning both her roles to make it clear that even the most self-aware and well-meaning of us can slip into an emotional time warp and find ourselves reacting to our past rather than to what's happening here in the present. This story begins when Tay's daughter Emily, who was nearly seven, shouted to her that she was stuck on a climbing frame and she needed help to get off. I told her to get down. When she said she couldn't, I suddenly felt furious. I thought she was being ridiculous. She could easily get down herself. I shouted, get down this minute. She eventually did. Then she tried to hold my hand, but I was still furious. I said, no, and then she howled. Once we got home and made tea together, she calmed down, and I wrote off the whole thing to myself as, God, kids can be a pain. Fast forward a week, we're at the zoo and there's another climbing frame. Looking at it, I felt a flash of guilt. It obviously reminded Emily of the previous week too because she looked at me almost fearfully. I asked if she wanted to play on it. This time, instead of sitting on a bench looking at my phone, I stood by the frame and watched her. When she felt she got stuck, she held out her arms for me to help. But this time, I was more encouraging. I said, put one foot there and the other there and grab that and you'll be able to do it by yourself. And she did. When she had got down, she said, why didn't you help me last time? I thought about it and I said, when I was little, Nana treated me like a princess and carried me everywhere. Told me to be careful all the time. It made me feel incapable of doing anything for myself and I ended up with no confidence. I don't want that to happen to you. Which is why I didn't want to help you when you asked to be lifted off the climbing frame last week. And it reminded me of being your age when I wasn't allowed to get down by myself. I was overcome with anger and I took it out on you and that wasn't fair. Emily looked up at me and said, Oh, I thought you just didn't care. Oh no, I said, I care. But at that moment, I didn't know that I was angry at Nana and not at you, and I'm sorry. Like Tay, it's easy to fall into making instant judgments or assumptions about our emotional reaction without considering that it may be as much to do with what's been triggered in our own background as with what's happening now. But when you feel anger or any other difficult emotions, including resentment, frustration, envy, disgust, panic, irritation, dread, fear, etc., in response to something your child has done or requested, it's a good idea to think of it as a warning. Not a warning that your child or children are necessarily doing anything wrong, but that your own buttons are being pressed. Often, the pattern works like this. When you react with anger or another overly charged emotion around your child, it is because it's a way you have learnt to defend yourself from feeling what you felt at their age. Outside of your awareness, their behaviour is threatening to trigger your own past feelings of despair, of longing, of loneliness, jealousy or neediness. And so you unknowingly take the easier option. Rather than empathising with what your child is feeling, you short circuit to being angry or frustrated or panicked. Sometimes the feelings from the past that have been re triggered go back more than one generation. My mother used to find the shrieks of children at play irritating. I noticed that I too went into a sort of alert state when my own child and her friends were making a noise, even though they were enjoying themselves appropriately. I wanted to find out more, so I asked my mother what would have happened to her if she had played noisily as a child. She told me that her father, my grandfather, had been over 50 when she was born. He often had bad headaches and all the children had to tiptoe around the house or they got into trouble. Maybe you're scared if you admit that at times your irritation with your child gets the upper hand, thinking it will intensify those angry feelings or somehow make them more real. 
but in fact naming our inconvenient feelings to ourselves and finding an alternative narrative for them, one where we don't hold our children responsible, means we won't judge our children as being somehow at fault for having triggered them. If you can do this, it makes you less likely to act out on that feeling at the expense of your child. You will not always be able to trace a story that makes sense of how you feel, but that doesn't mean there isn't one. It can be helpful to hold on to that. One issue might be that as a child, you felt that the people who loved you perhaps didn't always like you. They might sometimes have found you annoying, hard work, disappointing, unimportant, exasperating, clumsy or stupid. When you're reminded of this by your own child's behaviour, you are triggered and you end up shouting or acting out whatever your default negative behaviour is. There's no doubt about it, it can feel hard becoming a parent. Overnight, your child becomes your most demanding priority, 24-7. Having a child may have even made you finally realise what your own parents had to deal with. Maybe to appreciate them more, to identify with them more, or to feel more compassion for them. But you need to identify with your own child or children too. Time spent contemplating what it may have felt like for you as a baby or a child around the same age as your own child will help you develop empathy for your child. That will help you understand and feel with them when they behave in a way that triggers you into wanting to push them away. I had a client, Oscar, who had adopted a little boy of 18 months old. Every time his son dropped food on the floor or left his food, Oscar felt rage rise up in him. I asked him what would have happened to him as a child if he dropped or left food. He remembered his grandfather wrapping his knuckles with the handle of a knife, then making him leave the room. After he got back in touch with what it had felt like for him as a little boy when he was treated like that, he found compassion for his own self as a toddler, which, in turn, helped him to find patience for his child. It's easy to assume our feelings belong with what's happening in front of us, and are not simply a reaction to what happened in the past. As an example, imagine you have a four-year-old child who gets a huge pile of presents on their birthday and you sharply call them spoilt for not sharing one of their new toys. What is happening here? Logically, it's not their fault if they are the recipient of so much stuff. You may unconsciously be assuming they are undeserving of so many things and your irritation at that leaks out in a sharp tone or by you unreasonably expecting them to be more mature. If you stop to look back, to become interested in your irritation towards them, what you might find is that your own inner four-year-old is jealous or feels competitive. Maybe at the age of four, you were told to share something you didn't want to share, or you simply weren't given many things. And in order not to feel sad for four-year-old you, you lash out at your child. I'm reminded of the hate mail and negative social media attention anyone in the public eye receives from anonymous sources. If you read between the lines, what it seems to be saying more than anything is, it's not fair that you're famous and I'm not. It's not so unusual to feel jealous of our children. If you do, you need to own it. Not act out negatively towards your child because of it. They don't need parental trolling. Throughout this book, I have put in exercises that may help you have a deeper understanding of what I'm talking about. If you find them unhelpful or overwhelming, you can skip them and perhaps come back to them when you feel more ready. Here's an exercise. Where does this emotion come from? The next time you feel anger towards your child or any other overly charged emotion, rather than unthinkingly responding, stop to ask yourself, does this feeling wholly belong to the situation and my child in the present? 
How am I stopping myself seeing the situation from their standpoint? One good way to stop yourself from reacting is to say, I need some time to think about what's happening and to use that time to calm down. Even if your child does need some guidance, there's not much point in doing it when you're angry. If you give it then, they will only hear your anger and not what you are trying to tell them. You can do a second variation of the exercise, even if you do not yet have a child. Just notice how often you feel angry or self-righteous or indignant or panicky or perhaps ashamed or self-loathing or disconnected. Look for patterns in your responses. Look back to when you first felt this feeling, tracing it back to your childhood, where you began to respond like this, and you may begin to understand to what extent this reaction has become a habit. In other words, the response is at least as much due to it having become a habit in you than it is to do with the situation in the present. Rupture and repair. In an ideal world, we would catch ourselves before we ever acted out on a feeling inappropriately. We would never shout at our child or threaten them or make them feel bad about themselves in any way. Of course, it's unrealistic to think we'd be able to do this every time. Look at Tay. She's an experienced psychotherapist and she still acted on her fury because she thought it belonged to the present. But one thing she did do, and what we can all learn to do to mend the hurt, is called rupture and repair. Ruptures, those times when we misunderstand each other, where we make wrong assumptions, where we hurt someone, are inevitable in every important intimate and familial relationship. It's not the rupture that is so important, it is the repair that matters. The way to make repairs in relationships is firstly by working to change your responses, that is to recognise your triggers and use that knowledge to react in a different way. Or, if your child is old enough to understand, you can use words and apologise as Tay did to Emily. Even if you only realise that you acted wrongly towards your child many moons after it happened, you can still tell them where you got it wrong. It can mean a tremendous amount to a child, even an adult child, when a parent makes a repair. Look at the belief that Emily was carrying. She assumed Tay, on some level, did not care about her. What a relief to learn her mother did care and had merely been in a muddle. A parent once asked me whether it was dangerous to apologise to children. But don't they need you to be right, otherwise they won't feel secure? She asked. No, what children need is for us to be real and authentic, not perfect. Think back to your childhood. Were you made to feel bad or in the wrong or even responsible for your parents' bad moods? If it happened to you... It is all too easy to try and repair your feeling of being wrong by making someone else feel wrong. And the victims of this are, far too often, our children. A child's own instincts will tell them when we are not in tune with them or with what's happening. And if we pretend that we are, we will dull their instincts. For example, if we pretend that as adults we are never wrong, the result can be a child who over-adapts, not only to what you say, but to what anyone may say. They can become more vulnerable to people who may not have their best interests at heart. Instinct is a major component in confidence, competence and intelligence, so it's a good idea not to damage or warp your child's. I met Mark when he came to a parenting workshop I was running. His wife, Tony, had suggested he attend. At the time, their son, Toby, was nearly two. Mark told me he and his wife had agreed not to have children, but that, at the age of 40, Tony changed her mind. After a year of trying and a year of IVF, she got pregnant. 
Considering we worked so hard in getting there, it surprises me now, looking back, how hazy I was about what life with a baby would be like. I think I must have got the idea of parenting from watching television when the baby is miraculously mostly asleep in a cot and hardly ever cries. Once Toby was born, the reality of no longer having any spontaneity and flexibility, of the tedium of a baby, one of us always being on baby duty around the clock, meant I began to swing between feeling resentful or depressed or both. Two years on, I'm still not enjoying my life. Tony and I don't talk about anything other than Toby, and if I try to talk about something else, it reverts to him in under a minute. I know I'm being selfish, but that does not stop me feeling like I'm on a short fuse. I don't see myself living with Tony and Toby for much longer, to be honest. I asked Mark to tell me about his childhood. All he could say was that he wasn't very interested in exploring it with me, as it had been completely normal. As a psychotherapist, I took not being interested as a clue he wanted to distance himself from it. I suspected that being a parent was triggering feelings in him that he wanted to run away from. I asked Mark what normal meant. He told me that his dad left when he was three. As he grew up, his father's visits became less and less frequent. Mark is right. This is a normal childhood. However, that does not mean that the disappearance of his father didn't matter to him. I asked Mark how he'd felt about his father's desertion, and he couldn't remember. I suggested it was perhaps too painful to remember, and perhaps it felt easier to be like his own dad and leave Tony and Toby, because then he didn't have to unlock his own box of difficult emotions. I told him I thought it was important that he did indeed unlock and open it because otherwise he wouldn't be sensitive to the needs of his own son and would pass down to Toby what had been passed down to him. I wasn't sure from his response if he heard what I actually said. I didn't see Mark until six months later at a different workshop. He told me he'd been feeling depressed and, rather than just dismissing it, he decided to start having therapy. To his surprise, he told me, he found himself crying and shouting in the therapist's room about his own father leaving him. Therapy helped me to put the feelings where they needed to be, with the desertion of my dad, rather than thinking I just wasn't cut out to be in this relationship or be a parent. I'm not saying I don't still feel bored or resentful sometimes, but I know that resentment belongs in my past. I know it's not about Toby. I can see the point of all the attention I give to Toby now. It's to make him feel good, not just now, but in the future. Tony and I are filling him up with love and, hopefully, that will mean he has love to give when he's older, so he will feel valuable. I have no relationship with my own father. I know Toby is getting from me what I didn't get from my own dad, that we are laying the foundations of a great relationship. Seeing the point of what I'm doing has turned most of my discontent to hope and gratitude. I feel closer to Tony again now too. Now I'm more interested in and present with Toby. It has freed Tony up to think of other things apart from him. Mark repaired the rupture with Toby, his desire to desert him by looking into his own past in order to understand what was happening in the present. Then he was able to change his attitude towards being with his son. It was though he could not unlock his love until he had unlocked his grief. Repairing the past Some time ago, a mother-to-be asked me what my one suggestion for a new parent would be. I told her, whatever age your child is, they are liable to remind you, on a bodily level, of the emotions you went through when you were at a similar age. She looked at me a bit bemused. A year or so later, with a toddler at her feet, that same mum told me that she hadn't understood what I meant at the time, but she'd remembered it, and 
As she grew into her new role, it had begun to make so much sense and had helped her to feel for her child as well. You won't remember consciously what it's like to be a baby, but on other levels you will remember and your child will keep reminding you. It is common for a parent to withdraw from their child at a very similar age to when that parent's parent became unavailable to them. Or a parent will want to pull away emotionally when their child is at the same age as they were when they felt alone. Mark is a classic example of someone who didn't want to face up to the feelings his child was bringing up in him. You might want to run away from these feelings and from your child too, but if you do, you will pass down what was done to you. There will be plenty of good stuff you will be passing on too, all that love you received. But what you don't want to pass on is your inherited fear, hate, loneliness or resentment. There will be times when you feel unpleasant emotions towards or around your child, just like you occasionally may towards your partner, your parent, your friend or yourself. If you admit this, then you'll be less likely to be unthinkingly punishing them for whatever feeling they have brought up in you. If you find, as Mark did, that you resent family life because you feel pushed aside, it could be because you were pushed aside as a child and not considered in one or both of your parents' lives. Sometimes this resentment can feel more like boredom or a feeling of disconnection from your child. Some parents think I'm exaggerating when I use words like desertion and resentment. I don't resent my children, they say. Sometimes I want to be left alone in peace, but I love them. I think of desertion as a spectrum. On the most severe end, there's the actual desertion of physically removing yourself from the child's life entirely, like Mark's father did. But I also consider desertion to include pushing a child away when they want your attention or not really listening to them when they are trying to show you, for example, their painting, which is your child trying to show you, on one level, who they really are. This feeling of wanting to push children away, of wanting them to sleep long and to play independently before they are ready so they don't take up your time, can come about when you're trying not to feel with your child because they're such a painful reminder of your childhood. Because of this, you're unable to surrender to their needs. It's true we may tell ourselves we push our children away because we want more of the other areas of our lives, such as work, friends and Netflix. But we are the grown-ups here. We know that this needy stage is just that, a stage. Whereas our work, friends and other leisure pursuits can be picked up when this small person does not need us so much. It is hard to face up to this to stop how we ourselves were treated being passed on to another generation. We need to notice how we feel, then reflect on that, rather than react to any feelings we don't properly understand. Facing up to the less acceptable ways we might want to act, in Mark's case, for example, running away, can also bring up feelings of shame. When this happens, there's a tendency to get defensive so as not to feel the shame, and if we do that, we change nothing and we pass our dysfunction on to another generation. But shame doesn't kill us. When we realise what is happening, we can turn our shame into pride because we noticed how we felt compelled to act and became aware of how we needed to change. What really matters is being comfortable with your child, making them feel safe and that you want to be around them. The words we use are a small part of that. The bigger part is our warmth, our touch, our goodwill and the respect we show them. Respect for their feelings, their person, their opinions and their interpretation of their world. In other words, we need to show the love we feel for them when they are awake, not just when they look beautiful asleep. If you feel yourself wanting a break from your children every hour of every day, 
what you probably need is a break from the feelings they trigger in you. To avoid being controlled by those triggers, look back at yourself as a baby or as a child with compassion. Once you've been able to do that, you will be able to identify with the need and longing your children have for you. It is, of course, important to get a babysitter from time to time and enjoy some adult pursuit. But be aware if the feeling of wanting a break feels particularly charged and seems to be there for most of the time. Then dare to remember what it felt like when you were the same age as your child is now. Time for another exercise. Looking back with compassion. Ask yourself what behaviour in your child triggers the strongest negative response in you? What happened to you as a child when you demonstrated the same behaviour? Exercise. Message from your memories. Close your eyes and remember your earliest memory. It may be just an image or a feeling, or it may have a story. What is the predominant emotion in your memory? What relevance can you trace from the memory to who you are now? How does the memory influence how you parent? Remember, if anything comes up when you do this exercise, for example, a fear of being ashamed, which may now be causing you always rigidly to cling on to being right, perhaps at the expense of your child, feel proud of yourself for having spotted it, rather than feeling like you will collapse under the shame or defensively steering away and carrying on with the behaviour you enact in response to that feeling. How we talk to ourselves. As I said at the start of this section, Children do what we do rather than what we say. So, if you are in the habit of beating yourself up in your head, your child is liable to adopt the same potentially damaging habit. One of my earliest memories is my mother looking in the mirror and picking fault with herself. And when, years later, I did exactly the same thing in front of my astute teenage daughter, she told me she didn't like it when I did this, and I listened and I remembered how I hadn't liked it either. Our inherited patterns of being and behaving can often be found in how we talk to ourselves, especially via our inner fault finder. Almost all of us have in our heads a sort of continual chatter or commentary that we're so used to we don't really notice what it's saying. But this voice can be a harsh inner critic. Maybe you tell yourself stuff like, that's not for the likes of me, or it could be, you can't trust anyone. I'm hopeless. I'm never good enough. I should just give up. I can't do anything right. I'm too fat, or I'm useless. Be careful of such inner talk, because not only will it have a powerful steer on your own life, but it will also have an impact on your child's life, influencing them to judge themselves and others. Apart from teaching your child to make harmful judgments, that inner negative voice finds ways to exaggerate a low mood, not confidence, and make us feel generally inadequate. And there's another good reason for you to catch how you talk to yourself. It seems that we pass on our inner voices to our children as well as our habits in plain sight. If you want your children to have the capacity for happiness, the thing that may get in the way more than many others is your self-critic. We are formed into adults by our childhood experiences. It's the fundamental way in which we humans develop. But it's hard to shake off. It can be difficult to stop this inner critical voice. But what you can do is notice when you are doing it and give yourself a pat on the back for noticing. Elaine is the mother of two children and works as an art gallery assistant. She is aware of her inner negative voice. It's usually about failure. 
that I shouldn't try something because it won't work. I'll be bad at it. I'll embarrass myself. So I dissuade myself from doing things. Then I criticise myself for being unadventurous and not applying myself. I tell myself I don't stick at things, that I'm shallow and have no real passion for or expertise in anything. Just saying this to you now, I can hear the voice in my head saying, yeah, well, all those things are true. I feel guilty when I think about who this voice may have come from because I love my mum very much. I have always known she loves me, always felt very loved, but mum is a worrier, has never felt good enough, has a lot of negativity. She is, and always has been, hard on herself. She can never take a compliment to, what a delicious lasagna, she'll reply, no flavour, too much cheese. Somehow, She's passed on this not good enough vibe to my sisters and me. We dwell on our failures and use them as evidence that we're no good and shouldn't even bother. Once I got a B in French and it felt like the end of the world. Mum does try to be positive, but it'll be undermined with an unguarded comment. At the final fitting for my wedding dress, I came out of the changing room and Mum pursed her lips, looked worried and said... Yes, yes, on the day with flowers and veil and everything, that'll do. Unwittingly, her own anxieties and insecurities can lay waste to the people around her. As well as having a self-torturous inner critic, Elaine said her mother also got a lot right, and I in no way want to demonise her. But, like most of us, it seems she may have been unaware of how she talked to herself and especially how her inner critic could be passed on to her children. When you notice how you talk to yourself, it gives you more choice about how you listen to that voice. This is how Elaine has learnt to deal with her inner critic. I'm determined not to pass it on to my children. I do not want them to have my fear of failing. It's so demoralising. I used to argue with what the voice said and I always lost, plus this used up so much energy and attention. Recently, I found the best way is not to engage with the voice. I almost treat it as I would a difficult work colleague, tell it, well, you're entitled to your opinion. I try to do the things the inner critic tells me I can't do. I make myself override my fears in order not to discourage my kids, to show them it's not so bad to fail. I have taken up painting again, despite the voice telling me to give up. Rather than judging what I paint, I am training myself to notice what I enjoy about it and which bits of each painting please me. An unexpected side effect of this has been more confidence, not only about my painting, but about life in general. If we separate the content of what Elaine is doing into a process, it goes like this. One, first recognise the voice. Two, don't engage with it or argue with it. Instead, treat it like somebody awkward who you can shake off if you acknowledge what they've said but without colluding with them by thinking, for example, you are entitled to your opinion. Three, Expand your comfort zone. By doing the thing your inner critic says you can't, you'll find more confidence. It's a real thing you can remember when self-doubt creeps in. 4. Being aware of the dangers of passing your inner critic onto your child will give you an extra incentive to be mindful of it. Here's an exercise. Reveal your inner critic. Keep a pencil and pad to hand and note down any self-critical thoughts you have throughout the day. Do you recognise these criticisms as ones you have seen others articulate in your past? Think of something you would like to achieve and the steps you would need to get there. Now notice how you talk to yourself about this thing. Are you saying anything to stop yourself? Does this voice remind you of anyone else? Good parent, bad parent. The downside of judgment. 
the very fact you're listening to this means you want to be the best parent you can. One of the things that stops this is judgment, both of yourself and of other people. How we judge ourselves as parents is my bugbear. Good parent, bad parent labels are not helpful because they are about extremes. It's impossible to be perfectly attuned to our children all the time. And even some good intentions can have harmful consequences. But because nobody wants to be labelled a bad parent, when we make mistakes, and we all do, wanting to avoid the label makes us pretend we haven't made them. Partly due to these labels of good mother, bad dad, or vice versa existing, to avoid the humiliation of being in the bad role, we can get defensive about anything we might be doing wrong. That means we do not examine or look at the ways we are misattuning to our children or neglecting their emotional needs. We don't look how to improve our relationships with them. It may also mean we hide from ourselves the things we may be doing wrong behind the things we do right so we can cling to the identity of good mother or father. Parental fear of facing up to where we might be going wrong doesn't help our children either. Mistakes, pretending our child's feelings don't matter or whatever else we've done wrong matter so much less when we change our behaviour and repair any rupture. But we cannot put anything right if it feels too shaming to admit our faults, and then this label of bad adds to that shame. Let's drop good and bad as attributes for mothers and fathers. No one is holy saint or sinner. A grumpy, honest parent, normally written off as bad, may be a better parent than a frustrated and resentful parent hiding behind a facade of syrupy sweetness. I'd go further. Just as we shouldn't judge ourselves, we should try not to judge our children. It is satisfying to put something in a box, label it and forget about it. But it is not good for us and it certainly isn't good for the person in the box. It's not helpful to judge a child as bad or good or indeed to judge them as anything, because it's hard to thrive with the restriction of a label, the quiet one, the clumsy one, the noisy one. Human beings change and grow all the time, especially small ones. It is far better to describe what you see and say what you appreciate rather than judge. So say, I liked how hard you were concentrating when you did those sums, rather than, you're great at maths. Say, I'm impressed with how much thought you have put into this drawing. I like how the house looks like it's smiling. It makes me feel happy. Not lovely picture. Praise effort. Describe what you see and feel and encourage your child without judging. Describing and finding something specific to appreciate is far more encouraging than a non-specific judgment of great job and far, far more useful than criticism. If a whole page of writing is nearly a completely untidy mess, but the letter P is perfectly formed, all you need to say is, I like how neatly you've written that P. Hopefully, next time, you'll like another letter as well. Here's an exercise. No more judging. Instead of judging yourself on what you make and do, Observe and appreciate what you get right instead. Notice the difference in how it makes you feel. For example, rather than saying or thinking something like, I make great bread, try, concentrating on my baking is paying off. Rather than, I'm bad at yoga, try instead, I've made a start at yoga and I've improved since last week. It's not so much the words. I'm not totally banning good or bad. It's about suspending judgment or holding our conclusions lightly rather than rigidly. This will do less harm to ourselves and to our children. I have started this book by looking at you rather than concentrating on your child because what makes a child the unique individual they are or will be if they are not yet with us is a matchless mix of genes and environment 
and you are a major part of your child's environment. How we feel about ourselves and how much responsibility we take for how we react to our children are key aspects of parenting that are too often overlooked because it's much easier to focus instead on our children and their behaviours rather than examining how they affect us and then how we in turn affect them. And it is not only how we respond to children that shapes their personality traits and character, but also what they witness and feel in their environment. I hope I've convinced you to examine how you react to the feelings your children trigger in you. Be aware of how you talk to yourself, look out for your inner critic and be less judgmental about yourself, your parenting and your children. Part 2. Your Child's Environment A counsellor recently told me a story about working with a refugee family. He was trying to empathise with them and to understand what it must be like to have no permanent home. One of the children piped up, Oh, we've got a home. We've just nowhere to put it yet. I was moved when I heard this remark. It sums up how the love and care between family members can be a safety net, which is something we all need. So, how can we take steps to ensure the relationships that make up being a family feel like a sanctuary? This is what I will be looking at in this section, how to build a family environment where your children will thrive. It's not family structure that matters, it's how we all get on. You, and whoever you live with, is your children's environment. A large part of how your children go on to feel about themselves and how they interact with others will form in relationship to you and the small circle around you. That's your co-parent, if you have one, siblings, grandparents, paid help and close friends. It is important to have awareness about how we behave in these relationships. For example, do we bring our appreciation to the people close to us or do we dump our anger onto them? These familial relationships are influential in determining how a child's personality and mental health develop. Children are individuals, but they are part of a whole system too. As well as close family relationships, a child's system also includes school, their own friendships and the wider culture. It makes sense to look at that system and do what you can to make it the best possible environment for you and for your child. It doesn't have to be perfect. Perfect doesn't exist. It's not the structure of the family that matters, which is good news if you're not in a nuclear family. The arrangements can be as conventional or as unconventional as you like. Parents can live apart or together, in a commune or a menage a trois, they can be gay, straight or bisexual, it doesn't matter. Research has shown that family structure itself has little effect on children's cognitive or emotional development and, in fact, over 25% of children are brought up in single-parent families in the UK, with about half of these single parents having been in a partnership at the time of the birth of their child and they do know better or worse than children from a more conventional setup. Once factors such as their financial situation and parental education are taken into consideration. The people in a child's life comprise that child's world. It can be one of richness and love, but it can also be a battleground. It matters more than most adults think that family life does not veer too far towards the battleground end of the scale. If children are preoccupied, if they are worried about their security, their safety and how they belong, they are not free to be curious about the wider world. Not being curious impacts negatively upon how they concentrate and learn. In one survey, teenagers and parents were asked whether they agreed or disagreed with the following statement. Parents getting on well is one of the most important factors in raising happy children. 70% of teenagers agreed compared to only 33% of parents. 
This could be because the emotional distress children go through when their parents' and carers' relationships aren't functional isn't visible to the grown-ups. You may know how hard it is for you, as a parent, to look at your child's pain. And therefore, it's really hard to look at how your own actions may have contributed to that pain. You may feel justified in acting the way you do, or helpless at the idea of changing your behaviour. It may feel daunting or even overwhelming for you to look at how you interact with your co-parent and other close members of your family. But I hope in this part of the book, I can give you some ideas on how to make improvements if you need to. When parents aren't together. Even if you live apart from your child's other parent, what matters is that you refer to them in respectful ways, that you can appreciate their good points and not always be emphasising their faults. I know this may seem impossible to some people, especially after a difficult breakup. It may make it easier for you when I tell you how important it is for a child. They see themselves as belonging, attached to and part of each of you. If one half of the partnership that brought them into being is often referred to as somehow being a bad person, that is all too often internalised by the child so that they too see themselves as a bad person. A child can also be torn apart by the pull to be loyal to both parents. So what's the best way to negotiate a split? A child fares better afterwards if the parents cooperate with each other and communicate well, and if the child continues to have regular close contact with both parents. If you can manage that, your child is less likely to become depressed or aggressive. As for the child's relationship with their non-resident parent, this also works better if there is clear, positive communication between the parents. If one parent, it is often the father but not always, drifts away after separation, the child is more likely to suffer distress, anger, depression or low self-esteem. This is why it's such a worry that, in the UK, more than a quarter of children whose parents have split up have no further contact with their father three years after the event. I understand it is not always possible to get along with an ex, as this story I'm about to share shows. Mel is mum to a six-year-old son, Noah. She had a relationship with Noah's father, James, for five years. They often lived in different countries and didn't see themselves as a committed couple, but they enjoyed each other's company hugely when they did get together. Mel's story may sound extreme, but anyone who's had parenting disagreements with an ex may find it useful. When Mel got pregnant, James assumed she would have an abortion. When she didn't, he was furious and tried to sever their connection. Now he pays minimal maintenance and only agreed to do so after the humiliating procedure of a paternity test. He wants nothing to do with Noah. When I've spoken to people in a similar position to James's, they've told me that they like their life as it is. They feel threatened and scared by the possibility of it changing if they were to acknowledge the importance of a dependent. And yet a child, who is not an it, but a person in your life, albeit one who is dependent upon you for a couple of decades, is more than a mere catalyst for change. If you were to look at becoming a parent selfishly, a child is in fact a source of enrichment. Also, a child does not cease to exist just because they are being ignored. Sadly, some men, and women, do distance themselves from their children, it's as though if they pretend they have nothing to do with them, they do not really exist. Mel instinctively knew that she must not tell Noah his father had let her down, even though she felt he had. If her son asks about him, she remembers his dad's many good qualities and talents and tells her son about them. If, in the future, Noah's father should ever want to re-enter his life, Mel being positive about him will help this process. As Noah gets older and asks more questions, it's becoming harder for her. 
She's worried that her son, when he does know the whole story, will take his father's desertion personally and that it might harm his self-esteem or maybe distort how he regards his gender or even negatively influence his own behaviour when he is an adult. Because Mel is aware of these pitfalls, she can guide Noah around them. But even so, there can be no guarantee he won't at some stage take the fact that his father isn't there for him to heart. Sometimes there isn't a prescription to make everything OK. Mel has a lot of loving and involved family and friends and feels they do go some way to filling in the gap for Noah where a father would have been. I've told you Mel's story because it's not always easy to conjure up a smooth-running, cooperative relationship with an ex. And when one is lacking, all we can do is try our best not to run down the other parent to our child, or, indeed, to ourselves. How to make pain bearable We want to make our child's life pain-free and worry-free. We certainly don't want them suffering because we were unlucky with our choice of the person we had a relationship with or because there is conflict in our close relationships, but it's impossible to protect them completely. No life is without angst, unsolved mystery, longing and loss. How you can make their pain bearable is to be alongside them and with them when they feel it. You will need to be present for your child and the people close to you, open and accepting to what they show you and what they feel. You may not be able to fix their pain, but by being with it rather than denying it or pushing it away, you can keep them company through it. And this kind of attuned company will make anything more bearable. I will be saying more about this in the part on feelings. When parents are together. If you are caring for your child with a co parent, the love, goodwill, caring, and respect between you will contribute to your child's sense of security. And yet, as anyone who's had a child knows, it puts a strain on your relationship. Spontaneity may be compromised. Time alone with your partner or other people you feel close to diminished time on your own reduced or disappear completely. Your or your partner's relationship with sex may change and opportunities for sex will happen less often. Sleep patterns will be disrupted and it is likely that you will have to manage on significantly less sleep. Each member of a couple or of a wider extended family might have different parenting philosophies and the dynamics within the relationships may shift. Your work habits will change, and if you stop paid work, that may alter how you see yourself too. There will be an effect on your social life. There may be less or no contact with former colleagues. Some friends may seem to recede for a while due to your preoccupation with your baby, and so on. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. If you are in a couple, the transition from that partnership to becoming a family takes some getting used to. And just when you think you've got used to it, it changes again as your child and or your family continues to grow. These changes can also contribute to the resentment you may experience towards each other and towards your child. By the way, it's better to admit any resentment, even if only to yourself, if you don't, you are more likely to justify acting out that feeling rather than taking responsibility for it. Life is never static and being able to accept, work with and embrace change is more useful than resisting it. Thinking about how you can be flexible may be more effective than trying to regain what was lost. This doesn't mean you won't miss your old life sometimes. And it does mean you may need to work at surrendering to your new one and embracing it. Remember Mark, he resented the way in which his life was turned upside down by the change from being a couple to becoming a family of three. And he learnt to accept that change by tracing the source of his resentment to his own upbringing and finding meaning in childcare rather than just writing it off as a boring chore. 
He also found that when he accepted joint and equal responsibility for his child with his partner, this freed her up to be more of her old self again, rather than being wholly preoccupied with her baby. How to argue and how not to argue. Most families argue, but it's how you work through any conflict or don't, and how it's resolved or not that matters. Differences in and of themselves do not have to damage a relationship and therefore your child's environment. People with successful partnerships and functional families have disagreements and argue. That's a fact. But when they do, they continue to respect and appreciate each other and to have their differences acknowledged and their feelings heard. Now let's talk about the nuts and bolts of arguing. In any conflict, there is the context, that is, what you are arguing about. Then there is how you feel about the conflict and how the other person feels about it. And then there is the process, which is how you go about solving the problem. To tackle difference, it's important to know how you feel about the context and to share that. The next step is to learn how the other person feels about the context and to take their feelings into consideration. If feelings are left out of it, both sides can get more and more heated as they play what I call fact tennis, lobbing reasons over the net to each other, finding more and more to hit the other person with. In this style of arguing, the aim of the conflict becomes to win points rather than find a workable solution. Finding out about differences and working through them is about understanding and compromise, not about winning. Let's take a typical family argument about the washing up. The washing up is the context, then there's how people feel about it. This is what happens when the process becomes fact tennis. Server. The trouble is, if you leave the washing up not done, the food hardens on it, then it is harder to wash up, so do it straight away. Fifteen, love. Responder. It's a better use of my time if I leave all the washing up during the day and just do it all together at once. Fifteen, all. Server. It is unhygienic to leave the washing up undone. Thirty, fifteen. Responder. Any accumulated bacteria will be killed when it is eventually all washed up. 30 all. Server. The dirty dishes attract flies. 40 30. Responder. It's winter. No flies have accumulated around the dirty dishes. Juice. And so on. When one person eventually runs out of reasons and is therefore deemed to have lost, they do not feel loving or warm towards their opponent. And if the winner feels good, it's at the expense of their partner. Another style people use to deal with difference and conflict is what I call look, squirrel, or distraction. This is when, instead of talking about what is bothering you or someone else, you change the subject. So you see that the washing up has not been done, but rather than address that problem, you say or do something else. This may be fine. It may be appropriate to delay talking about something, but it is not OK to avoid discussing differences altogether. If all conflict is avoided, what tends to happen is that intimacy is avoided as well. Because when too many subjects become taboo, politely skirting around each other can make things lonely. A third arguing style is being a martyr. This is when you say, as you arrive home, don't worry about the washing up. I'll do it. Unfortunately, what tends to happen in situations like this is that the martyr, rather than making everyone feel guilty, eventually becomes resentful and blames other people or becomes a persecutor and starts flinging insults. The persecutor attacks. You're a real pig for not doing the washing up. Your hygiene standards are disgusting. If you are at the other end of that comment, you will feel like attacking back. None of these four kinds of conflict make for a great atmosphere in the family home. Conflict puts children on alert, threatens their sense of security 
and leaves them less able to be open and curious about the world. Instead, their energy and focus are switched into a sort of emergency mode. What, then, is the ideal way to argue? When working through a difference, work with one issue at a time and think about what the argument is really about. Don't save up all your grouches and pour them out onto the other person all at once. Start with how the issue makes you feel, not with an attack or by blaming. So back to the washing up. I feel fed up when I come home after having washed up in the morning to see more of it. What would really make me feel better would be if you washed up your stuff during the day. The ideal style isn't about winning. It's about understanding. An answer might come back. Oh, sorry, darling, I don't want you to feel bad. I had so much work on. I can see it's not a great sight to come home to. And the response to it might be, yeah, you do have a lot on. Never mind. How about you wash and I'll dry? A good rule of thumb when arguing is to do it with I statements, not you statements. For example, I feel hurt when you don't answer me when you're on your phone. Not, you're always ignoring me when you're on your phone. Few of us like to be defined or pigeonholed, especially negatively, by someone else. If you describe how what you hear or see makes you feel, then you are talking about yourself, which is far easier for the other person to hear. Of course, no way of voicing a complaint is guaranteed to work, that is, ensure you get what you want, but good relating is not about manipulation. It is about having good relationships. Being open about what you feel and what you want can help you to have good relationships, whereas manipulating someone doesn't make for a good connection. Speaking in I statements, not you statements, owning your own feelings and finding out and acknowledging the other person's feelings are usually the best ways to deal with the inevitable differences that arise in families. It will also help your child feel more secure as it reduces resentments and promotes understanding. They will also be more likely to adopt this respectful and emotionally intelligent argument style themselves having had it as their example. One reason disagreements arise in the first place is when one person thinks they've been attacked on purpose when they haven't. This example happened in a typical family. I'll call them the heritage family. Johnny, a 22-year-old student, is inspecting his dad's old leather jacket. He says, you're 60, Dad. You're never going to wear this again. Can I have it? Keith, a teacher, has had a bad day of not understanding his son's generation at work, so is feeling old. And Johnny has hit a nerve. Keith raises his voice and says, What? Can't you even wait for me to be dead before you start eyeing up my possessions? Johnny feels that this has come out of nowhere, and now he feels attacked. Blimey, I only asked. Why are you always having a go at me? I'm not having a go at you, but I don't like being treated as though I'm already dead. This isn't a serious dispute. I'm pretty certain that Keith will end it by throwing Johnny his jacket and saying, you have it then. And Johnny saying, I don't want it now. You'll need something to wear in your coffin. And they'll both laugh themselves into a truce. But if they don't understand what went on, they'll both still feel a bit hurt and then something similar is liable to happen again. So let's see what was really going on by pretending there is a wise mediator there with them. He wants me dead, says Keith. No, I don't. I want his jacket, says Johnny. Same thing, says Keith, realising at the same time it is not the same thing. The mediator says... It is not the same thing, but today, for you, Keith, it feels like the same thing. And Johnny has no reason to know that. You, Keith, felt attacked. As Johnny didn't realise that you felt attacked, he felt what you saw as your retaliation came from nowhere. 
so he counterattacked. That's certainly true for me, Johnny says. Keith is quiet, so the mediator says to him, just because you felt attacked doesn't mean you were attacked. He called me 60, Keith defensively replies. Mediator. Yes, he was hiding his feelings behind a fact, a habit he has picked up from all the fact tennis he's been witness to since he was born. Moving on. It seems you find being 60 hard to come to terms with, so you'd quite like to cling to symbols of your youth, like that leather jacket. There's no reason why you shouldn't, and you can say so if it's true. A new version of the conversation might sound like this. I love your leather jacket. Can I have it? I need some time to think about that. I can see you really want it, but I'm not ready to let the jacket go. It's true, I may never wear it again, but I need to get used to the idea of being as old as I am. And, in the meantime, clinging on to my youthful clothes is a comfort to me. Sorry my asking reminded you of being 60. Oh, don't worry, I need reminding. I'm feeling a bit old because I don't understand what some of my students are going on about. Like what? I've just got my head around what social media is, but what do they mean when they say swipe left at me? Here, let me show you. Exercise. Unpack an argument. Think about the last disagreement you had with a loved one. Without getting caught up in who was right or who was wrong, unpack what happened like I did in the example between Johnny and Keith. Then, again, as I did in that example, take a meta-perspective to see the situation and work out the feelings of each protagonist. Then, play the role of a wise mediator and think about how to change the dialogue in the disagreement and how it could have gone better. Here's a quick recap of what to remember when you're talking about a difficult subject or when you're getting annoyed or think that an argument is imminent. 1. Acknowledge your feelings and consider the other person's feelings. That means not making yourself right and the other person wrong, not making yourself clever and the other person stupid. Nothing wears a relationship or a family down more than if the people within it insist on being the person who is right. Instead of thinking in terms of right and wrong, think in terms of how you each feel. 2. Define yourself and not the other, so speak in I statements and not you statements. 3. Don't react, reflect. You don't always have to reflect before reacting. I'm not advocating that you lose all spontaneity. But if you feel annoyed or angry, I think it is a good idea to pause and understand why. If Keith had done that in the previous example, he would have realised that the anger he felt towards his son when he asked for the jacket did not belong with his son. 4. Embrace your vulnerability rather than fearing it. In the example, Keith would also have realised he was scared of growing old and he was about to mask that fear with anger rather than allowing himself to be vulnerable. But it is only by allowing our vulnerability, being open about who we are, that we can have close relationships. 5. Don't assume the intent of the other person. Without assuming too much or projecting yourself onto the other, try to work out what they are feeling too and admit it if you got it wrong. Understanding your own feelings and those of the person you are negotiating with is not only the cornerstone of negotiations, it is the foundation of functional relationships and of empathic parenting. It is never too late to start this way of interacting. When parents are able to do all this, I've found that improvements in patterns of relating to one another usually come pretty swiftly. Fostering goodwill. In a couple or in a family, having the ability to consider each other's feelings 
requires a store of goodwill. If you feel you're running low, you need to bolster it up. So, what fosters goodwill? There seem to be two main ways to do it. One, responding to bids for connection or attention, and two, finding solace in each other rather than seeing the other or others in the family as adversaries. In other words, both cooperation and collaboration, but not competition. When psychologist John Gottman and his colleague Robert Levinson set up what they called the Love Lab at the University of Washington in 1986, one of their experiments was to ask couples to talk about their relationship, to discuss a disagreement they had had with each other, to talk about how they met, and a positive memory they shared. While the couples had these conversations, they were wired up so that their stress levels could be measured. All couples appeared to be calm on the outside. However, the results of the stress tests showed something completely different. Only some of the couples had, in fact, been calm. Others had high heart rates, sweated a lot, and generally showed all the signs of being in fight-or-flight mode. But the real revelation came six years later, at the follow-up session. All the high-stress couples had either split up or were still together but in a dysfunctional relationship. Gottman called these couples the disasters. The ones who had shown no stress during their initial interview, he called the masters. It appeared from the data that the disasters each experienced the other as a sort of threat, more like an adversary than a friend. Gottman studied thousands of couples over a long period of time and found that the higher the couple's stress indicators, the closer they were to being disasters and the more likely they were to split up or have a dysfunctional partnership. So what do these findings mean? The more you feel stressed and threatened in the company of your partner, the more likely you are to act in a hostile or cold manner towards them. The more your relationship is based on getting one up on them, on winning or losing, on being right, the more likely you are to feel hostility rather than goodwill towards your partner. It can be a relationship vicious circle. One-upmanship is all too common in our culture as a way of being together. Even advertising seems to rely for its success on making the target market feel superior to others. This is second only to making the target consumer feel sexually desirable. I'm thinking of the dumb dad advertisements for cleaning products or commercials where the prize for buying a product seems to be that you get to be smug as if you have somehow been proven to be superior to your partner. Conversely, when a couple feels calm and soothed by being together, this makes each partner more likely to be warm and affectionate with the other. Gottman set up another experiment where he observed 130 couples socialising together in a holiday home for a day. What he discovered was that when couples are together, They make what he refers to as bids for connection. For example, if one partner is reading and says, listen to this, and the other one puts down their own book ready to listen, their bid for connection has been satisfied. They are looking for a response, a sign of support or interest. Responding to someone's bid meets their emotional needs. Gottman found that couples who were no longer together after six years, the time of the follow-up session, had on average only a 3 in 10 response rate to such bids. These small day-to-day interactions generate goodwill and reciprocal treatment, and without them our relationships cannot be sustained. So this is the key to a successful partnership. Be responsive and interested. And what is true for couples is true for all relationships, and especially for those with our children. As well as responding to requests for attention, there are other things you can choose to do that will foster goodwill, or the opposite. You can look for things to appreciate in your partner, family members, and indeed in your children. Or instead, 
you can scan them for faults and mistakes. You can choose to express your appreciation or your criticism. I know which I prefer to hear. You can choose to be kind, and the good news is, kindness is catching. If you are unilaterally kind, research has shown that it is likely that your partner will catch it and pass it on. Tipping the scales, if they are unbalanced, from being critical to finding things to appreciate is not only crucial in your partnership or in your relationship with your family, but in life as a whole. I come from a family where the culture was tipped slightly more towards criticism than appreciation, and I have had to work hard to change that. When I slip back into old habits, it can feel like I'm bathing myself in a toxic soup of criticism. Being kind is not about being a victim or being unassertive. Being kind does not mean that you don't share your feelings when you are angry. What it does mean is explaining how you feel and why, but without blaming or insulting the other person. It is also important to know that just because you did not intend that your action should cause a family member to be upset or irritated, it does not mean that those actions did not upset them. When someone feels bad in response to something we may have said or done, even unintentionally, it is important to listen and to validate how they feel rather than become defensive. We need to remember that we all experience the same things differently. No one is wrong because their experience is different from what ours would be. Such differences need to be respected rather than causing you to get into arguments as to who is having the right experience. There's lots of advice out there. Some of it will tell you not to sweat the small stuff in families and relationships. Others counsel the exact opposite and advise dealing with minor irritations before they become big. The main thing I believe we should aim for is understanding how the other person feels, even if we feel differently, and feeling for them where they're at and, hopefully, being felt for in our turn. Everyone benefits from being listened to, understood and empathised with. Make this a priority in your family. It will make your family a good place for a baby to land and a good environment for a child to develop in. Here's an exercise. Notice attention bids. Become more aware when members of your family make a bid for your attention or connection and, if possible, Turn towards that bid rather than turning away. This is whether the bid comes from your partner, your mother or your children. Relationships are precious and turning towards bids is a major part of relationship maintenance. Although we are individuals, we are also very much part of a system and a product of our environment. As we have seen in this part of the book, there are several things we can do to help that system and environment be a healthy place for our children to grow. Thank you for listening. To continue the book, head to the link in the description below. And click here to subscribe to the Penguin YouTube channel for more audiobook samples and videos with your favourite authors.